Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Estamos todavía esperando. Good morning and welcome. We're waiting for the participants to join the session. Bien, bueno, vamos a dar inicio mientras se sigue uniendo. Well, as more participants join us, let's start the webinar. We're here today in this course, El Niño in the Americas, Protecting Health and Promoting Resilience, uh, hosted by the World Meteorological Organization, the UN Office for the Disaster Risk Reduction, PAHO, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, and the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education. Today, we will be uh, talking about uh, heat extremes. I will be your moderator as the strategic advisor at the IAI. Uh, please choose the language of your choice. Uh, you can find the languages at the bottom of the screen on the Zoom menu. Language of your preference in the Zoom menu. Bien. Como pueden ver, esta es la segunda sesión. As you de... can see, this is the second session in the course. Next session will be held on Tuesday, the 17th of October. Today, as I was saying, we are focusing on heat extremes and some more participants are joining as we speak. I would like to remind you how the sessions work. Today, we have a 90 minute session. At the end of the session, we will have a Q&A section. Please uh, uh, write your questions and answers in the Q&A section in Zoom. We will be recording this session. It is the session is being recorded now, and we will be sharing the link to the recording within 24 hours on our uh, different platforms such as LinkedIn. For instance, in the chat, we have included the uh, LinkedIn uh, link where you can access the materials. The materials will also be included uh, on our uh, websites, both the IAI and the GCCHE. Okay, so more people are, are joining us. Today, here we have some of the recommendations that were prepared by PAHO. So, we suggest that you review the link shared in the chat. This link will also be shared in our LinkedIn group. Please join our link, LinkedIn group so that you can access all the materials. If the information hasn't been updated yet, we will be doing so within 24 hours. Please bear with us. If you speak English today, we will be having this session mostly in Spanish. So please uh, have a look at the slides in English that Haley has just shared in the chat so that you can follow the session more easily. Okay, let us now begin with Francisco Cesini, who works at the Environment, uh, the Environment Ministry in Argentina. He has a degree in environmental health awarded by the National University of Entre Rios. He's a specialist in health engineering from the University of Buenos Aires, and he's now uh, doing a master's degree in that university. He's currently a technical leader at the National Program for uh, the Reduction of Health Risk Associated with Climate Change at the Coordination of Environmental Health in the Ministry of Health in Argentina. He's a member of the Ibero-American Society of Environmental Health, CIPSA, and the Interdisciplinary Laboratory of Climate and Health. 
then I would like to introduce Tania uh, Vargas, who is here today, and she will be presenting a case study. Francisco, you have the floor. Thank you, Irene. And thank you to the GCCHE. Thank you, PAHO. Thank you, uh, the WMO, and also the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this interesting course and very relevant course to uh, relevant to our current times. And uh, especially regarding El Nino phenomenon. As Irene was saying, today we will be talking about El Nino regarding or in connection with e extreme uh, temperatures. Uh, today, these are the topics that I would like to address regarding the connection between El Nino, extreme temperatures and health in the Americas. Please have a look at the topics for today. First, we'll be addressing the health risks approach, and this will be today's session. Then we'll be talking about El Nino and temperatures in South America, also heat waves and climate change, and how the, these waves interact with El Nino, vulnerability to heat waves, health effects of heat. And from that, we will be uh, talking about public health actions, such as developing early warning systems, preventive measures, hospital readiness and health monitoring. Um, please include your questions in the chat. And, and after my presentation, after Tanya's presentation, uh, we will be having a Q&A session. As I was saying, I aim to start today's session by uh, implementing a health risk approach considering in particular how climate on its different levels impacts uh, health from uh, a natural variability perspective, as in the El Nino phenomenon, and also South uh, Oscillation El Nino, and how climate man-made uh, climate change, how both in a synergy have an impact on the distribution of meteorological and climate phenomena regarding health risks and also there are two other factors that impact the risk and these are vulnerabilities as the uh, as the individual and community capacity to face these threats and also exposure reg regarding how these people are exposed to these meteorological phenomena uh, from the intersection of these three fields threats vulnerability and exposure we have health risks, as in the probability of something wrong happening. And we are paying attention to probabilities here. So how can we reduce this risk? The risk can never be fully eliminated, but we can reduce it by implementing two approaches. First of all, disaster risk reduction and also climate change adaptation. This is our conceptual uh, framework for today's session. So first of all, let us have a look at, briefly have a look at the uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation or ENSO as a phenomenon that causes, that changes the atmosphere ocean uh, group in the tropical Pacific and how this the, the change in these uh, conditions in this area of the Pacific, changes in temperatures or increasing temperatures in the ocean, in the uh, in this uh, area of the Pacific, El Nino, and also Nina, which is a decrease in temperatures. All of this is part of a cycle that whose frequency varies between uh, two to seven years. At the top, you can see how these phases have varied since 1980 between El Nino and La Nina. We've just gone through three La Nina years, and now we're beginning an El Nino period. This entails changes in a global climate, but in particular in the Americas, this entails uh, changes in the humidity and temperature patterns. On the right, at the bottom, 
you can see the main El Nino events that we have had since the 80s until today and how El Nino, uh, this new El Nino that which you can see in, in gray in 2023 is taking place. This would be a moderate El Nino compared to other events that have been more serious. But of course, it, it remains important. El Nino has been thoroughly studied, reg studied regarding the changes in uh, precipitation distribution in our region. And to a lesser extent regarding temperature anomalies. Here on the screen, we can see the temperature anomalies expressed in an increase in temp temperature or temperature decrease compared to the historic mean figure. For four three month periods in a region. So on the first map, we have December, January, March, then uh, until May, number three, June, July, August, and number four, September, October, November. This would be the four seasons that we have in the Southern Hemisphere uh, from summer to spring. We can see that the surface, uh, the air surface temperature is connected with increased temperature with El Nino phenomenon. In particular, regarding uh, temperatures ab above 20 degrees, well, actually in the intertropical area in our region. Um, here we got, and this includes the north of Chile up to Colombia, Venezuela, and also some Central American countries. These countries will uh, be expected to have increased temperatures, temperatures above the normal figures, both in summer and autumn. Okay, I'm saying summer and autumn because I'm thinking about uh, uh, from an Argentinian perspective, this would be December, uh, January, February, March, April, May, actually. And in particular, in the south of South America, so that is Argentina, Uruguay, south of Brazil and Paraguay, we're expecting anomalies with temperatures below the usual uh, level. So regarding uh, heat uh, anomalies, we're not expecting an increase in the summer. So El Nino would not be causing increased temperatures for the south of South America. This might happen in the north of Chile and northeast of Argentina, however. <clears throat> And these may also persist in autumn. In autumn, we already see some anomalies for the south, in, in the south of South America, in particular, central and north Argentina, Uruguay, south of Brazil, and north of Paraguay. Therefore, the countries that are at the highest risk of increased temperatures for the next few months are the countries that are above 20 uh, degrees of latitude in the south. Something we must remember, the ENSO phenomenon includes at most two thirds of the interannual temperature variance. This means that this does not explain every change and some changes can be due to other variability phenomena or by general uh, climate change trends. And this is what we can see here since 1940 until last September. Here we have the series of every covering every September month since 1940. And have a look at 2000 until the two uh, until the year 2000. The anomalies were below the historical anomalies, and as of 2000, the frequency has increased. In particular. Last September, there was almost one full degree above the historical data globally for September. And this entailed increased temperatures 
throughout the North of South America, also in the South of North America and in parts of Central America. This is something that we can see through the, we saw through a major heat wave in Brazil that took place very recently. What's happening here in the South of South America regarding extreme temperatures? These maps are organized, organized from the top to the bottom according to each quarter. Uh, between December and November. We can see that for winter and spring uh, for the Southern Cone, so that's June, July, August, September, October, November, we can see an increase in the frequency of hot uh, evenings. So these are minimum temperatures above the 90% percentile, which entails an increase for Argentina, center and north of Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, south of Bolivia, and north of Chile. This is a case in particular in June, July, August, and September, October, November. While maximum temperatures above 90% percentile uh, that correspond to hot days are expected to increase in the north of northwest of Argentina, north of Chile, and in some cases also in the south of Brazil and in Uruguay. Therefore, El Nino is associated with hot evenings in winter and spring in the central north of Argentina uh, through teleconnections. This has been studied since 1979 and uh, 1979 until 2005, and we can see this paper written by Cochaso et al. What uh, does WHO say about the key health risks uh, regarding El Niño for this new season? Well, heat stress and air pollution we are expecting a high probability and this might have an Im a moderate public health impact and a high risk level. This is based on the fact that heat stress is a leading cause of climate related death, which can exacerbate underlying NCDs. Also, air pollution is a result of multiple mechanisms, including smoke from forest fires, which can increase this risk and also increased temperatures might explain uh, the presence of some secondary contaminants such as ozone. Well, this has to do with El Niño and extreme temperatures, but I was saying El Niño cannot fully explain the behavior extreme temperatures in the next season. Rather, heat waves are also associated with climate change. How? First of all, we need to say what we understand by heat waves. Heat waves are an unusually hot, dry or humid period that lasts two, three days or more and usually has a clear, uh, a clear beginning and an abrupt end. It can have a negative impact on both humans and, and ecosystems. The IPCC tells us that since 1950, globally, heat waves have become more, more frequent and intense. Also, in every region on the planet, extreme heat events have caused human mortality and morbidity. Therefore, this might mean that El Nino and climate change might create a synergy and this next uh, upcoming season might see an increased risk, an increased risk for health uh, uh, regarding heat waves. So if we go back to the first chart, that has to do with the risks. But we also said that health risks are also determined by the intensity of the threat, but also by vulnerability factors. Uh, these are individual and community factors. Individually, fact, in, individual factors include age, um, medicine consumption, physical conditions, uh, health, 
and other factors such as type of housing. Um, and we'll, there are also some community factors that will impact vulnerability, such as income, how the city has been designed, also if the health system is ready to face these events or not. Also working in exposed um, environments, air contaminate, pollution, etc. Based on this, we have created vulnerable groups, groups that are vulnerable to heat waves. There are the two uh, uh, ends of life, population age 65 and over, uh, also babies and children are they fa under five people with chronic diseases such as diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, mental diseases such as Alzheimer and Parkinson's, also high blood pressure and morbid obesity. Uh, also people that are under treatment, with different medications and other uh, drugs, and also all the people that live alone or the people that live in the streets in um, negative social and economic conditions, people with disabilities, people who are exposed because of their work in outdoor areas, and also people that uh, perform activities that create a lot of metabolic energy, such as high performance um, sports people. Some individual factors that increase vulnerability in the Americas. This corresponds to the indicators available uh, on the pa on PAHO's website. In the Americas, 40% of the population uh, is uh, age 65 and over, and this means 130 million inhabitants for our region. The population of children below the age of five amounts to 6.6%, and this uh, amounts to 69 million children in the region of the Americas. And if we think of adults, we have some risk factors connected to non-communicable diseases, such as high glucose, with a percentage of 8.4 in the region, but with a range of between 5.5% and 14.5% in the region. The prevalence of overweight and obesity is 62.6%. So six out of 10 people in the Americas are either overweight or obese. And high blood pressure is 17.8% with a range of between 12.9% to 27.1%. And each of these risk factors may be present um, synergically in, in one person. One person might have high blood glucose, high blood pressure, and be obese. And they also might be 65 years old or more, so those add up. Another very particular phenomenon in a region that comes on top of, of the com other complex factors for addressing heat risk in the Americas is urbanization. The region, Latin America, is the most, uh, the developing region in the world that has the most urbanization with cities ranging from 20,000 inhabitants to the largest cities, urban centers that have uh, dozen, dozens uh, of millions of, of people living there. So the expert, they're growing continuously since 1950 and the ex growth has been exponential while rural populations have remained um, constant. And I wanted to highlight this because the heat wave can take place and then come on top of, of some other things that happen in cities that are heat islands. This it means that because of the way they are formed, 
cities have some uh, because of the materials they're, they're used for buildings like concrete there the thermal isolation um, this causes heat to be accumulated during the day and that heat is then released at night so there's a temperature difference that is very high between rural areas and cities if we uh, we travel a bit away from the cities, we see that the temperatures decrease uh, dramatically. We see this for the three most populated cities in Argentina, Buenos Aires, Rosario, and Cordoba. And so we see during the summer, uh, the difference, uh, the temperature difference between the city and the surrounding rural areas is 1.2 degrees, but at night that difference is up to two degrees. So between downtown Buenos Aires and the rural areas outside. Um, the, this observation is similar for Rosario. It's double the, the temperature difference between days and night. Uh, it happens the same in Cordoba. Um, with a smaller difference than the city of Buenos Aires, because they are smaller than Buenos Aires, but it's still remarkable. And how does that uh, urban heat, uh, we're dealing mostly with, with the urban areas, but it does also affect uh, the health, the human health in, in rural areas. Uh, our human body, we are homothermal animals. We, we manage an internal stable temperature. So we're always exchanging heat with our environment through processes such as releasing heat by radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation, uh, mostly of sweat. So there are other factors that also affect these processes such as behavior, such as cognitive or physical deterioration, psychiatric illnesses. For example, babies cannot regulate as well. They increase in, in heat gains because of metabolic heat, but because we're um, exercising or we're taking, taking certain drugs some factors that affect um, cardiac expense, some factors that reduce the volume of plasma, such as diarrhea, kidney disease, again, some drugs, and some factors that affect sweat, such as dehydration, aging, diabetes, and some drugs as well, again, uh, have an effect here. So what has happened in our region uh, regarding heat waves in the last, um, in the in recent times? The most recent information we have is for South America, is from the Lancet Countdown Report for South America. And we see that deaths relate, heat related deaths have increased by 160% in during the 2017 2021 period. Also, in 2020, was one of the three years with the most heat related deaths for all countries, and seven of the 12 countries reached. Uh, some historical numbers, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, and Venezuela have been the most affected. And if you look at the charts on the right, the trend is growing for all countries. In Venezuela, we have a, there's a, a drop at the end. In Uruguay, uh, the, the trend seems to be more smooth, but in general, overall, the, the trend is going upward. And this is something we see in the region because of the frequency and intensity uh, or severity or, of heat waves. In Argentina, we looked at 
a specific heat wave during the summer of 2013-2014 that affected mostly the center and the north of the country. And in December, it reached 17 provinces and it uh, lasted on average 6.9 days, but it was this was highly variable. And in seven of those 17 provinces had an increase in mortality. There were 1,046 excess deaths. There was a shorter heat wave uh, during January that affected 16 provinces and increased mortality in six of those. There were 635 excess deaths. And finally, there was one in February that was quite long and affected the provinces in the northeast of Argentina and the south of Brazil and also the south of Paraguay. And in three of those jurisdictions, we had an increase in mortality that was quite significant and there were 196 excess deaths. In that study, we were also able to see that the death risk increased with age, especially in people aged um, 70 to 79 and 80 and older. And we also saw that some causes of death showed an increased risk like uh, respiratory diseases, cardiovascular uh, strokes, etc. Globally, there is a lot of evidence about the connection, be the relationship between heat and non-communicable diseases. And I think this is uh, a kind of a novelty to think of this in connection with El Niño because we had been studying the El Niño so far in connection with communicable diseases with some outbreaks caused by uh, some vectors, zoonotic diseases. But as we have seen in our region, there's an epidemiological transition that has already taken place and non-communicable diseases have um, more weight than communicable diseases. So we don't, we don't, uh, we can't forget about this because there is a risk to health associated with extreme temperatures in terms of, of non-communicable diseases. These are some, some pieces of information from the literature that the risk for stroke um, increases by 1.5% for each degree of temperature that, that increases. As for cardiovascular diseases, heat waves have been associated to an 11.7 increase in the risk of cardiovascular death. For respiratory diseases, heat waves are associated to an estimated risk of 1.18%. And for as for diabetes, the risk of mortality during heat waves was 1.18 for mortality and 1.10 for morbidity. And this is in terms of, that was in terms of mortality and looking at the main non-communicable diseases, the, the four that are the most relevant in our region, which are also represent 80% of the deaths by non for non-communicable diseases. Also, uh, since the, 2000s, there's an emerging disease in the Caribbean that is uh, was described uh, first in the 2000s, and it's chronic dis kidney disease from non-traditional causes. It has affected workers in the last, uh, and, and 20,000 workers have died in the in 10 years. 
And why is it non-traditional cause? Because we have patients that come in with terminal kidney disease, but they have none of the risk factors, diabetes, hypertension or obesity. Most of the cases are in young men who uh, work in agriculture, but not just that group of that subset of workers. There are also some um, people who drive in public transportation, some garbage collectors, some street vendors, so uh, in the beginning, because they were mostly farm workers, they thought it was connected to pesticides, heavy metals, or extreme heat. And the conclusion that was reached the most recently is that heat is mostly um, the cause. So what are the public health actions that we can do? Uh, first, we need to plan our actions. We need to think of what to do before these heat waves. We need, these are the minimum components. We can think of more complex ones. But the first thing is uh, counter season planning and uh, during winter. So that's. Um, I say winter because I have the bias that where I live, we have very uh, clear uh, seasons, but we need to think of this before they come. We also need to establish, to establish early alert systems uh, jointly with national meteorological services. So the ministries of health need to reach out to meteorological services to develop the systems based on epidemiological information and evidence. We need to have communication flowcharts who, what and when is going to be communicated to establish care for the general population and vulnerable groups. We need to train the health systems and social services to care for the population. We need to bring in other actors because as we have seen, the workplace is somewhere that can the risk can be increased. We also need education. We need to include sports. We need to uh, monitor health in real time as, as closely as possible the perhaps the closest thing we could have is the epidemiological week. But uh, if we look at it uh, after the season, that is also good. And we need methodologies to assess the phenomena once the, the season of heat waves is over. As for our early alert systems, I'm going to discuss the one we have in Argentina for extreme temperatures, especially for heat, but we also use it for cold. It has three levels of alert. The red one uh, represents a uh, high to extreme effect on the health. Orange means moderate to high impact on the health. For example, dangerous for babies or people over 65 years of age or with chronic diseases. The orange level can be very dangerous for at-risk populations. The red one is for it has uh, represents extreme impacts and it can affect everyone, including healthy people. This system was developed jointly by the Ministry of Health of Argentina and the Meteorological Service, and it was based on different epidemiological studies generated in the field of, of atmospheric sciences and public health. What uh, are the criteria for issuing alerts? For yellow alerts, which is the first, the lower level, they are issued based on, on the forecast. If the forecast for the next three days shows that there's a likelihood 
of a heat wave, then we issue the first alert. And it can be maintained if, the, for example, in Argentina, a heat wave is, um, we have established a threshold for each meteorological station, uh, a temperature threshold. And then if during the next two days, or if two continuous days have already been observed with those higher temperatures, or three days of heat wave, but with no forecast of, of that continuing. However, if we have three days of heat wave observed and there's a forecast uh, within 24 hours for our heat wave, it uh, is raised to orange. Or if there are four days of heat wave with uh, the minimum temperature is uh, above the 90th percentile of the historical series, and there's a forecast of extreme temperatures. And finally, if we have three days of extreme heat wave, so over the 95th percentile for the lower temperature. And there's a forecast of a heat wave within 24 hours, so for the next day, with a very extreme uh, temperature above the 95th percentile in the historical series. And the, that is uh, a red alert. And the alert uh, ceases when the phenomenon is over and is expected mostly to end abruptly. And then we need to communicate the risk to the health. And here I have some examples of communication in Argentina. These are some um, things um, things to share in social media, alerting of high temperatures. It's important to drink water to eat uh, some eat vegetables and, and fruit mostly, to stay in cool and well-ventilated areas, to drink water throughout the day. And the blue charts that you see at the bottom are developed by the Ministry of Health of Costa Rica and that are recommendations for hydration. And I thought it was really interesting because they are in different languages. And this is important because communicating the, the risk should be uh, accessible to, to the entire population. And of course, in Costa Rica, there's a diversity of languages spoken and it's important to communicate this to the entire population in an accessible manner. Another action that, that needs to be considered for prevention is community prevention. And this, are, this is an example of cooling centers. This has been applied in Europe, also in the US. This is an example from California. And you can see that there's a status published of, of cooling centers. They are libraries. Um, some Catholic uh, center, some community centers, for example, think of churches in your cities, uh, in the, the historic part of, of cities, they have high ceilings, they have very thick walls. And if you think of, of when you go inside, um, during the summer, it's cooler inside. So that could be a cooling center. That could be a place to receive the population that may be at risk during a heat wave. And this communication of California presents all of the cooling centers that also have hydration stations, where they are, what, at what uh, time they are in operation. And this could be easily done by working in coordination with different authorities at the local level. And there's uh, this is an example of people resting at a club because extreme temperatures at night affect sleep. And this can also increase the risk for health. Another thing for prevention is uh, at workplaces, it's very important to, to measure the thermal, the heat load. We see this index 
that is used uh, the WGT, that is the uh, valve temperature that integrates, uh, combines heat and humidity. And so it shows us the, the heat burden that the, the workers are exposed to. This is done in Nicaragua. And you can see that after 8 a.m., this temperature index uh, is over the, that threshold of 28 degrees. That is not, uh, it's an integrated index. And there's also, uh, above this, is considered to be hard work. So they should rest, uh, they should have 15 minutes of rest for every hour of work. And this is something uh, that they have, trans this has tr been translated into some interventions of measures for prevention in Central America with an initiative that is the, called the Island Network. We're mostly working with communities working during um, sugarcane harvesting season. They incorporated some shade and some hydration spots. I don't know if you can see the recommendation very well, but for cane cutters, from seed cutters, and from field workers, there are, for example, for 7 a.m., they need to rest 10 minutes for every hour and five minutes for field workers. But at 10 a.m., the rest should be 20 minutes for every hour for cane cutters and 10 minutes for field workers. And cane cutters, who are the ones that have the highest uh, physical exertion, have uh, a working day of only six hours while seed cutters and field workers can work up to eight hours. But you see, they start their day at 6 a.m. and they finish at 2 p.m. And they also take need to take rest between, rests between 10 to 20 minutes. You see, at noon, seed cutters and field workers need to rest 30 minutes and work 30 minutes. That is the only way that uh, heat stress uh, doesn't cause an impact on health that mostly translates to chronic um, kidney disease. Francisco, I would like to remind you that you, that you have a few minutes left. Uh, also regarding prevention and in other massive events, for instance, this is a rock festival held in Argentina every summer. And they uh, suggested that participants take with them some water bottles because they would have hydration stations so that they would uh, be able to get some water during the event in order to run, not to run any uh, risks regarding their health. Finally, regarding hospital readiness in order to face heat waves. We need to monitor high risk patients in order to identify uh, symptoms associated with health. We also need to adapt pharmaceutical treatments. We need to postpone non-urgent surgeries in order to have to be better prepared to deal with urgent patients. We need to ensure better availability, especially in emergency services and urgency services. Also increase, increase healthcare staffing and activate procedures to ensure adequate health and social care for hospital discharge of high-risk patients. Uh, if we send patients home, they might suffer from the heat even more seriously. So maybe this discharge can be postponed in order to prevent further risk. And we also we need to ensure that high risk patients are housed in air conditioned wards. These are the ideal recommendations. And then we need to check in each, our, each of our hospitals how we can um, implement these recommendations. Also increase patients fluid intake 
not only the ones that have seen their health effect uh, health affected also we should modify diets accordingly and increase fruit and vegetable consumption and we should um, uh, adapt bedding patients bedding and personal clothing finally there is health health surveillance this is an example of the surveillance of a plan that we're implementing in argentina regarding a uh, healthy um, climate uh, heat related um, health events. We have prepared an epidemiological form in some selected hospitals where this first part includes the typical information uh, about uh, the center and also regarding more general terms. And also, um, we have re a reference to different symptoms on several conditions that have to do with heat, such as uh, different types of exhaustion, a low, lower volume, edema, and other internal um, problems. And there are other health uh, risk factors, such as diabetes and other uh, endocrine problems, uh, organic mental issues, cardiovas cardiovascular dis disease, also respiratory system problems, um, obesity, and other serious and chronic diseases. Regarding how we should characterize epidemiology, regarding risk factors, we aim to know if the exposure was work-related, leisure-related, if the person was exposed to a source of heat, or, or if there was intense physical um, activity, or maybe the person is taking some drugs that is a, a, affecting the temperature regulation, or if the person has been using drugs. If the exposure was work-related, we need to find out what the person does. Finally, here we know if the person was uh, exposed to extreme heat. This is something that we will be using in both events. So that's all I have to say. Hopefully this has been useful. And of course, I am uh, here uh, ready to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Francisco. Thank you for your um presentation there are many questions and hopefully we'll be able to answer some of them also uh, francisco feel free to answer questions in our q a section if you want to write an answer as we select the questions thank you now we have tania vargas she specializes in uh, climatological research at the Sub-Department of Climate uh, Forecasting in Peru. She has a bachelor's degree in meteorology and uh, meteorological engineering awarded by the Universidad Agraria La Molina. She has a master's degree awarded by the Appalachian State University, North Carolina, USA. She has also worked at NOAA's International Desk Meteorologic, uh, Meteorology Desk. She has worked at Senami in Peru for nine years, and she works mainly as a forecaster. She has been part of the climate and health team, and she is a represent Senami's representative in the National Commission in charge of studying El Niño phenomenon. She will be to presenting a case study. Thank you so much, Tanya. You have the floor. Está silenciada, Tania. Disculpe, estaba con el micro apagado. Bueno, sorry, uh, my mic was off. Thank you so much, Irene, and thanks. Uh, thank you, everyone, for organizing this event. Thank you for inviting us, Tsunami uh, Peru, to participate in this event. Let me just share my screen so that you can see the presentation. Okay. Yes. Tengo no presentación. Perfecto. Is that okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, this is a study conducted two years ago about defining heat waves. We aimed to identify the best definition because as Francisco has explained, several definitions are used to define heat waves. What we needed was to identify one of the indices that would reflect 
its influence on human health. To do this, we, co we consider two main cities in Peru, Piura and Lima. Both of them are the most highly populated cities in along the coast of Peru, and they have a, a high uh, population. This study included several experts, and it was led by Cristina, a colleague. She no longer works in our institution, but she was the one that led the study. Also, Laura, with Laura Carlos Sanchez. Now, let us see why. Although Peru is a tropical country, and this is a, a topic uh, that we must address, do we need to monitor heat waves in the tropical areas? And the answer is yes. And in Peru in particular, this year with the uh, coastal El Nino, we have seen very high temperatures, not just along the north coast, uh, in Piura, uh, where we have this increased temperatures associated with coastal El Nino, this also affects other parts of the of the coast, and this has affected the health of people, but also people's health. But also, it has affected other sectors such as fisheries, agriculture, even uh, forest fires. Although. This doesn't necessarily take place along the coast, but on the range and in the jungle. What are the consequences of these heat waves on uh, human health? As Francisco has said, there are indirect and direct impacts. If we talk about El Nino in particular, in Peru, we have quite a different effect or differentiated effect. Have a look at this map, for instance. In green, you can see the areas affected with ex extreme precipitation levels in the in our southern uh, summer, which is January, February, March. In yellow, you can see the areas where there is a um, there are insufficient uh, precipitation levels. These will have uh, um, Excess the precipitation will have several impacts such as increased vectors and other problems. And also some diseases will spread more easily such as dengue fever in April, March and April, we had peaks that were similar to the trends in 2017. Regarding the negative effects uh, or the lack of rainfall, we have we see an increase in respiratory diseases caused by heat stress. Also, uh, vector-borne diseases spread more easily. Dengue, uh, for instance. Uh, regarding El Nino, we do have precipitations, but also, as I said at the beginning, we have an increase in extreme temperatures. Therefore, the aim of the study was to determine which indices we must use in order to uh, monitor and forecast heat waves. These were two specific cases. Piura, sorry, I didn't tell you, Piura is in the north of Peru. And Lima can be located towards the center of the coast near the cap in the capital city. So how are heat waves defined? These are the definitions we tend to use. These are unusual periods of hot, wet, or dry weather with a gradual onset and uh, termination of two to three consecutive days uh, where, where a certain threshold is um, exceeded. Several thresholds or statistics are used in order to determine, determine that we are in a heat wave. We will see this later on. These are the areas studied. We have uh, in the north, Puda, which is usually a dry area throughout the year, except for summer where we have rains. It's also an arid area because it's included in the Pacific area of the desert. There you see in red, the, the desertic areas. It, Lima is also along the desert line. And as you can see, it's a temperate area that tends to be wet throughout the year. If you know, uh, sorry, 
it, it is not humid throughout the year. In Lima, it doesn't really rain a lot throughout the year. And it's different from Puda. We have, for instance, more clouds in the winter and Puda tends to be sunnier. Data used in the study. Here we can have both, see, uh, we use two stations. The study was conducted, conducted in the hot period, part of the summer and part of autumn as well, between December and April. And we use the following data, maximum temperature, dry and wet bulb temperature, wind speed, uh, and regarding health, We worked with the information technology management, data management office with information about daily mortality between 2003 and 2017, uh, except for 2015. Regarding methodology, this was quite a process. We started systematizing heat wave information. After this uh, calculation of thermal indices to uh, uh, we talked about these thresholds or percentiles to decide um, the, the threshold at which we will consider that we are experiencing a heat wave. Then we also make an association with the human with human health, and then we analyze the information. These charts show us the uh, snapshots taken in order to check extreme temperatures automatic conventional stations, etc. And at the end, we have some of the results. We conducted a risk factor analysis in order to check if this association uh, appeared between the presence of heat wave and journal mortality. Criteria. Here we have several indices used, such as maximum temperature, air temperature at 1 p.m., heat index at 1 p.m., wet bulb globe temperature and apparent temperature. And here you can see the times. And we'll also use the daily percentiles, in this case, 90 and 95. Regarding event duration, worked with one day, two days, and three days. In total, we had 30 possible uh, combinations in order to define the heat wave. These, it's more information about the indices. As Francisco has said, for instance, he considers that the wet bulb general temperature, also apparent temperature, which also considers the wind velocity, uh, the wind speed and heat index as well. Regarding age groups, we worked with uh, all the population and we divided it into under five, between five and 18, between 19 and 65 and over 65. In these combinations and groups, we conducted tests in order to determine the, to see which results we obtained. Regarding thermal indices, this, these charts uh, maybe are not so uh, clear to see, but we have maximum temperature, heat index, apparent temperature, etc. Here we consider also 90, uh, percentile and there is a difference the higher the threshold the lower the frequency of events and with that was the case with two days and with three days there was a more marked reduction of each event or heat wave another result we had the systematization this is an example for uh, uh, that shows a san miguel station in piura here we can see how many events we had for each month. In this case, and also depending on the thresholds, how long they lasted uh, on average. And we found some similarities by implementing each threshold um, and by restricting our work to the 95 percentile. But usually the variations we found were similar. When we uh, calculated the relative risk of mortality due to heat wave in Pura, we did find some differences. And also regarding some of the indices, uh, we found a significant difference by using 95 percentile and considering two days of heat waves and implementing the maximum temperature variable. 
for the Suyana station, we also had this variation with a maximum temperature, but in this case for three days and not two days. Um, when we uh, have a look at this summary of the previous chart, this is uh, East Lima with a risk factor higher than one. The major indices are the ones that showed this connection between increasing uh, increased heat waves and increased mortality with a maximum temperature, as I showed you on the previous slide, by using 95th percentile and for Cuda as well for two days and Suyana three days. Something similar was implemented for Metropolitan Lima. In this case, we had uh, two, uh, three significant indices. Number one, the heat index, maximum temperature of air, and wet bulb globe temperature. The three of them were significant. Uh, what is the effect of this heat wave? It will not necessarily be felt or be detected at the beginning. So we prepared these charts in order to determine um, um, how many days later we could see this effect on mortality. The, we studied these two cases and we only found that they had a short-lived effect uh, from the beginning until the end. Uh, during the heat wave, which lasted one to two days. And remember that two days was almost the maximum figure for uh, Puna. And in Lima, we found between 1 1.5. Finally, we systematized the heat events we, with the indices we had defined. And we did this for the heat period between December and April. And this is the result. Puna, with a maximum temperature in this index and Suyana, and for Lima, we had three indices. Conclusions. Um, um, sorry, I forgot something at the beginning. We consider, we are considering general mortality. We're not distinguishing because when we go went over the data, we hadn't systematized the data, the health data we had analyzed. Uh, so there was no connection between um, mortality, heat, etc. So, you know, checking which diseases are associated within the deaths in the periods, in the heat wave periods, had to do with uh, cardiac disease mainly, and um, cardiac disease and renal disease. Um, coming back to the conclusions, Puda, we found that the definition of heat wave in Puda would be of two consecutive days in which the maximum air temperature exceeds the daily 95th percentile threshold, in particular for health. That was in Puda. Suyana, same temperature, a maximum temperature index, three consecutive days in which the maximum air temperature exceeds the daily 95th percentile threshold. For metropolitan Lima, we also found a 95th percentile for East Lima districts, the ones that are furthest away from the sea. Regarding relative risk or increased mortality, remember I showed you two uh, values, only two uh, spots, they were around 1.2. So in this case, for Pura and Lima, uh, Metropolitan Lima, the heat wave results are very close and they contributed to increased mortality risk by 20% during the event duration, up to two days after the onset of the event, Pura, and up to one day after the onset of the event, in this case for Metropolitan Lima. Uh, this applied to East Lima. By using the chosen definitions in the final systematization for the warm period, we, we found that the events uh, we could have between one and two uh, heat, wa heat wave events for Pura and in Lima, it would be between one and three events that would last between one and four days. Uh, but what has happened, and this is something that has been happening in 2023. Um, in Peru, we used to study El Nino, we used the coastal Nino definition, which is the increase 
in temperatures in what we call the one plus two El Niño monetary region in the north of uh, Peru, uh, bordering Ecuador, that, that is the Western Pacific. When the, the temperatures increase in this area, they directly affect the air temperature. And this um, heat, or this event begins in February and has lasted until today and it is affecting the increase in temperatures. We've had a hot summer, a hot, a hotter autumn, a warmer winter as well. Maybe now in spring, we have noticed uh, uh, a small decrease of temperatures. So this is one of the monitoring sessions conducted at Tsunami. And this monitors the uh, center, north and south of the coast. Have a look at this, please. We have detected some days where the 90, 90th to 95th percentile have been exceeded and several records have been broken as well. Uh, since uh, the beginning of the historical series, we have now new um, values. This coastal Nino has uh, caused some increased temperatures or global increased uh, temperatures along the coast. So some days have exceeded these thresholds regarding temperature, but, but this has decreased in the last few days. As I have said, we have uh, set many record, we have detected many record values. On this chart, we can see how many degrees above the usual temperatures we have seen. This is a case for maximum temperatures. For instance, in May, we should already have a trend, a, a temperature decrease trend. But for instance, in Lima, we had 31.5 uh, degrees as a maximum temperature, and the normal figure would be 24.6. So we have daily records, monthly records as well, because in July and August of 2023, we had the warmest months, not just along the coast, but also nationwide. And considering the records that we've had since 1994, that was maximum temperatures. And also for minimum temperatures, as you can see, we have recorded new records of extreme temperatures uh, in most of the coast. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to make this presentation. And uh, of course, Francisco, I'm ready to answer the questions that people might have. Thank you. Thank you, Tania. We have so many questions. Some have already been answered in the chat, in the Q&A. Uh, section. Thank you so much, Francisco, for your health. Let's have one uh, question for Francisco. Do you know how we can um, tell about the cause of death uh, because of heat? Maybe this could have done during the COVID pandemic to distinguish between COVID-related deaths and heat-related uh, deaths. Sorry, that's a great question. <laughs> it's interesting because many times it's difficult to, to, to determine which factor actually leads to someone's death. Uh, someone asked this in the Q&A session. And they said that uh, just saying that diarrhea cases would increase because of temperatures is, is a bit simplistic. Because, of course, we know there are many factors that affect the appearance of uh, the onset of a disease. Um, our models aim to control these factors in so by uh, controlling different courses, we can determine if one of these factors increase the risk. But models always simplify reality. Regarding deaths or heat-related deaths, um, in every country in our region, deaths are determined according to the International Disease uh, Code. There is a code which is X. 30. 
it is related to mortality on account of extreme heat. When we wanted to study that summer in particular, 2013, 2014, and we looked up the code, there were many deaths that had been coded according to this code, something like eight in one summer. So what did we do? We analyzed general or global mortality. And then I have a question for Tanya, but uh, you know, I wanna stay focused. When I talk about global mortality, we only analyze natural causes, we excluded external causes. Otherwise we would be including um, traffic, car accidents and other factors that might confuse us. Among the natural causes, we analyzed increased risk by comparing two periods a period with a heat wave and another reference period without the wave. And we studied the increase and if it was significant. We did this for natural um, causes and for other um, by age group as well. And some uh, causes of death, such as cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, diabetes related, uh, we had enough epidemiological evidence and epidemiological feasibility explaining the connection between heat and dying uh, because of uh, co caused by one of these conditions. Thank you, Francisco. Another methodological question um, addressed to Tania. Um, how do you measure temperature data? Because someone's asking if measurements are affected if we're talking about an indoor and outdoor place. Yes, regarding data uh, measurement, the, the WMO says that um, the seasons or, or the temperatures are recorded in a, in a, not a fully closed station. They have some, you know, um, uh, areas where the, the air can enter. So an observer goes to the station that takes the measurements and they record the measurements. In the case of automatic stations, um, there is a sensor that automatically records the temperature and reports the highest, and they report the highest peak. Thank you so much. I, there's a question about mental health because people are, are more interested nowadays in mental health in general. Someone asks, in Canada, some people were um, disproportionately impacted um, if they had some sort of psychiatric condition. Are there trends in this regard? That's a very interesting uh, question. The latest IPCC report talks about the need to study mental health and climate change. Uh, as we analyzed the data classified into regions in last year's report, uh, we saw that we had insufficient information for the Americas regarding the connection between mental health and climate change. Why? Because the topic hasn't been thoroughly studied, not because the risk doesn't exist. I think that the main challenge in this case is to um, study how the information is produced. Usually our health systems, uh, health information systems, uh, focus on conditions or infectious diseases, and they focus on mortality as well. Um, usually mental health problems do not necessarily lead to deaths or this is not seen. So our current statistics are not collecting this type of data. And uh, this is a case for other events as well. Therefore, we need to implement new strategies in order to collect this information. And these are not quantitative methods. We might have to resort to social science uh, strategies in order to explore the topic or maybe um, uh, address, you know, hospital discharge figures or consultations in health centers to see if, uh, see what happens with mental health centers or mental health hospitals to see if there is a, a change in the, in the, 
uh, health, mental health appointments. But yes, this is a huge field to study that hasn't been thoroughly studied as have other topics such as emergency appointments, etc. And their connection with extreme uh, heat events. Thank you, Francisco. Tanya, you showed us some uh, really complex charts which are easy for you, you meteorology, uh, for you meteorology to understand, but not so much for us. How can we deal with these risk factors in Peru uh, so that health experts can understand them? Nowadays, we only have this study uh, conducted in Pura and Lima, but we are now systematizing events and heat waves, not just along the coast, but also including the Andes and the Amazonia. But for now, we only have these risk factors calculated for Pura and Lima. In this case, is there a difference between the coast and the Andes? Yes, basically, this might have to do with uh, heat waves. On the coast, we have an arid area where temperature increases uh usually humid heat waves however in the hills humidity content is low and when we have high temperatures they are mainly associated with dry conditions and in this sense the impact is different as well because uh, they might be connected with um, forest fires and this is another triggering factor because we have increased temperatures and also that there is contamination, organic material that is burned and um, wind might spread uh, these conditions. Therefore, the, the impact is higher. That there are more indirect impacts that are not so closely associated with uh, heat waves. Um, something similar happens in the jungle uh, because it's also a very humid area and we might have some effects similar to the coastal area uh, on the on the hill area on the hills area yes the conditions are quite different thank you francisco you said that you impl that you use a southern cone perspective because of our clear seasons but maybe there is a change in the uh, climate trends. May we might have a new category, as in new seasons. Uh -huh. Is that the case? Well, um, maybe that's a bit too conclusive because uh, I, I am no expert in atmospheric sciences. Tanya might answer this. Uh, but as I understand in this uh, changing climate scenario, I think that seasons might be a bit blurred. And this is at least what we have seen regarding um, pathogen distribution. Maybe in the past, uh, pathogen distribution was clearly um, seasonal, for instance, you know, summer diarrheas, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is something that happens often in Argentina. Also, I don't know, pneumonia in the winter. But now this seasonality is blurred, yes. But I'm not sure if that is the same, that affects the climate as well. May I, maybe I can say something about that. Uh, seasons. Seasons are defined by our planet moving around the sun. So some dates are fixed, but regarding um, pattern changes or changes in the system or circulation, uh, sometimes we see that the summers are longer. Yes, there's a change. I think that this year, at least in Peru and Ecuador as well, the changes have been clear because we have seen very high temperatures and people would say, okay, summer is now longer because we've had the impact of El Nino in this case. Um, other years, 82, 83, 97, 98, we also had these El Nino events. And we also saw a clear change along the coastal area regarding temperatures. Uh, there was no winter because the temperatures were high throughout the year. And it, this is something that, uh, that we already see. 
Thank you for your contributions. We might be talking about new epidemiological seasons and not necessarily climate related seasons. One more question. Francisco, do you think that this idea of having fresh centers can help us um, face these heat events and also address some uh, social health de determinants? Yes, these are uh, experiences in central countries. We will need to see how we can adapt them to our reality. You know, for instance, shopping centers um, tend to have very good uh, conditions, uh, uh, temperature conditions. Also churches, uh, which tend to be uh, quite cool in the, in the summer. Um, also, we need to downscale this project. For instance, elderly people that live alone and the risk increases because if they need something, they might have no one to ask for help. So we need to think about uh, primary care centers at a hospital, for instance. I don't know, cultural centers, libraries, uh, um, a center for uh, retirees where they can, I don't know, uh, have some fun or and stay, stay uh, cool. That would be interesting. And I think this has to do with another question. Um, it's like these are many, um, there, there are many solutions regarding our client scenario. Uh, shouldn't we adapt our cities? Yes. I prepared this presentation by considering this new and so phenomenon and hopefully for March, April of 2024, we will be able to say goodbye to this event. So regarding El Nino, we need a quick response. And regarding climate change, thinking about these cool centers, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We need to think about how questions can create less heat and decrease this urban a heat island phenomenon with uh, by using less public transport by getting people to um, to move less and to come up with more human scale solutions and not huge uh, human scale cities and, and not huge cities. But uh, I'm being more humble in my recommendations. My recommendations have to do with the health sector. Actually. Thank you so much, Francisco. So this is the end of today's session. We'd like to thank our panelists. I am so happy to have heard you, uh, to have listened to you today. And I'm sure my, the, the other participants are very happy as well. There are so many questions that we cannot fully answer during the session. Um, I would like to remind you that next session on Tuesday is about quality, water quality, and security. We'd like to thank our interpreters as well who have helped us today. Thank you to all the organizing partners of our course and of today's session. And thank you to the participants.